Omar, thanks for joining us today. It's the first day of Ramadan and we're both in lockdown on a Friday, the first Friday. I think it's the first time in the Muslim world where most Muslims are sitting at home and Friday prayers just finished. And uh, in Jordan, you would go to jail if you go to the mosque. Uh, Omar, you're the head of Eat Restaurant Group, Eat Holding. And as of this year, the restaurant group has grown. I mean, it's it's massive, over 50 outlets across three continents. And I think in 15 cities, as of before Corona, that you guys operate. It's an incredible growth journey. I mean, only a few years ago, you guys had half the number of brands and in just a handful of cities. This is an amazing story. How did you guys grow so fast? So yes, we are in three continents. We're in 13 cities. Uh, we have 55 stores in our network of franchisees and, and restaurants globally. The journey started a very long time ago. The real journey started in 2006, where I took over a business that my brothers had set up in 98. We took the business from two stores. The idea was to grow the number of restaurants in Jordan and the ambition of going regionally, globally was always there. It took, I would say, five to six years to actually get our first regional deal signed with a lot of mistakes and closures and issues that happened along the way. And I would say in 2013, that was really the starting point of our regional growth. And last year was our starting point for global growth. What we've really focused on is building restaurant experiences, either in the traditional sense or in the delivery uh, world. The interesting part is that uh, what we realized is that diners in general look for an overall experience. It's not only about the food, it's about that full experience, the branding. Uh, a lot of the brands that we've done, I've noticed that have been female driven in terms of the customer base uh, and they appeal to females and then you know males followed suit. Obviously this year, we will need to re-pivot the journey into a new direction. Um, to make sure that we are ahead of the curve in terms of the trends that will come post the COVID-19 pandemic. You guys have been really good with your delivery focus. I mean, outside of the fast food industry in the region, I think you guys are one of the best geared for delivery in terms of your apps and your approach. Do you think you guys are going to face a much easier time pivoting to the new trends post-corona? I think most restaurateurs take delivery for granted. It was always, you know, the extra sell. The most important thing that I learned is that delivery is a different occasion. It's a different uh, need. Uh, when you order delivery, it's very different than going to a restaurant. Unfortunately, as restaurateurs, we missed many opportunities in deliveries that others mm. captured before us being, you know, the aggregator spaces, the, the Talabat, uh, delivery, yeah. uh, Uber Eats, Deliveroo, etc. They, they came in and organized the business and ate up, you know, a chunk on the top level. Um, but it's what's very important is for restaurateurs to realize that delivery is a different occasion. And unfortunately, in current times, it's the only occasion. Mistakes that we've done is, you know, the way we used to list our menus online. We used to... Uh, list them the way we would list the restaurant menu, like, you know, appetizers, salads, mm. soups, main dishes, etc. In delivery, you have to think of it in a, in a very different way. People have, get fatigued online and they don't want to browse through big menus. Before, we used to upload our whole menu. But now we focus on having, you know, 20 solid menu items uh, on delivery. So um, we uh, pivoted into delivery, I would say, in March of last year where we really went into something experimental in building uh, virtual brands or what we call virtual brands that operate out of cloud kitchens. Yeah, cloud kitchens now is something everybody talks about. It's kind of like the buzzword. Some people call them ghost kitchen. People started to realize there, is a big, there are big opportunities on delivery. Some restaurants had opportunities in areas that were uncovered. So instead of building a restaurant, they, they actually plugged in to uh, 
a delivery kitchen. The first movers were the founder of Uber invested in a company that started to build cloud kitchens. Deliveroo in the UK started to build yeah. the editions kitchen. If you had a restaurant in London, you can cover Manchester through delivery only through renting a small space. Cloud kitchens typically are the we work of the restaurant business where you have shared services, shared preparation areas, shared storage areas, shared prep areas. So we ventured into this in March of last year. We set up a couple of uh, virtual brands. One of them is actually a brand that was um, that we had to close in 2012. So we brought that back on a delivery only. And actually today it's our most successful delivery brand. Which one is it? Shawarmama. It didn't work in the brick and mortar high street model. So now without the overheads of rent, we were able to pivot Shawarmama into becoming a, uh, a delivery only uh, brand operating out of five markets. We have Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, New York. So we actually were able to grow that, that brand in six months. Amazing. Wow. And uh, good thing you guys had uh, already done the, most of the branding yeah. concept and the menus. You know, this is uh, actually uh, one of the nice silver linings, if you want to think positive, about the restaurant industry. When the occasion you mentioned becomes more of a home occasion. So instead of dinner and a movie, it's dinner and Netflix. The overheads in uh, delivery kitchens or cloud kitchens are so low that you really can focus on the menu and the branding. And like you said, the strategy of your online presence, how you display the menu. Do you feel like overheads on digital strategy and digital marketing and daily tweaking of your approach, depending on the hour of day, the day of the week, the human behavior at home, is that way less costly than just being in a, a shopping mall food court, for example? It's a different model. And it is not as simple as, you know, just uploading a menu online. There are two tricks. One is how do you transform that brand experience into a home experience? So you have to invest in packaging, the convenience of packaging. You have to think of travel time. Mm. And then how do you tell the story of your brand and create the, the personality and the identity of your brand through an online presence. Mm -hmm. So it's really about visibility on these aggregators and how you position yourself on these aggregators and to make sure that you have a very strong and unique social media presence because these are the only touch points to your brand. So it's your social media, your packaging and how you uh, mm -hmm. look online. As a company today, we are in an interesting and unique position because we don't believe that the traditional brick and mortar business will come back the way we're, we've been used to. I think it'll take probably a year at least to come back to what we have been used to. I think that delivery will grow and uh, there will be a, a rat race in delivery. Fortunately, we do own our own app in Jordan that allows us to actually reach our customers directly. We are looking to grow that into other geographies and we are looking to grow multiple new brands that are delivery focused and that are well studied for delivery. So this is called uh, onboarding. Yes. So onboarding is something we've taken as a strategy as a company. Either we onboard existing brands and through leveraging our know-how and our platform, we can onboard brands to grow them onto uh, okay. delivery platforms. Yeah. So in your space, your app obviously houses your current brands and uh, your onboarded brands. So in one app, you can go in and yep. you can select. Yep. We have our brands. We have onboarded brands that we actually co-own. Mm -hmm. And we are now taking a strategy of onboarding carefully selected brands onto our app to grow the app into mm -hmm. a boutique niche app that's not crowded with like 100, 200, 300 restaurants. Me as a casual diner, I have used uh, the big guys in the market like Talabat and there is so much noise. There's dozens of pizza delivery Definitely. places. It's tough to experiment. You really want to cut through all that noise. So I think there's a great opportunity when you have a very curated selection of, uh, of each cuisine. Like the shopping mall would not allow 50 uh, you know, eyeglasses shops. They would have a cap on and probably in their food courts they do the same thing so you're kind of a virtual food court where you've yeah. selected yeah um, what's missing from your what cuisines are missing that you're hunting for now to onboard 
Look, traditionally, pizza and burgers and fried chicken are the biggest sellers on Deliver. So I think we still have room for some burger brands, for some more pizza brands, because some people like the thick pizza, some people like the Italian, American, mm. etc. And the ch- fried chicken sandwich has become big. So we are building a fried chicken brand. I think desserts now will become big online. Mm-hmm. We will be onboarding some ice cream brands. Nice. And I think more and more comfort foods that travel well, that Mm -hmm. people enjoy at home. And also what we've noticed is because we're in this delivery space globally, we've seen the trends on delivery. It's, it's global. I mean, you see a trend pick up somewhere and then you see it everywhere. So for example, pokey is big now. Uh, Acai bowl is big everywhere. So we're also hunting for the next new delivery trend. And what's going to happen now on the bigger aggregators, they've gotten into the grocery. So now if you go on Talabat, there's even a lot of noise now on grocery and vegetables. And I think people that didn't order delivery or were not used to the idea of ordering through an app, now after in lockdown and with the pandemic, we're going to see a bigger user base. No, absolutely. Coronavirus has forced consumers to embrace technologies. As a retailer myself, we had our first batch of deliveries uh, yesterday. We've delivered to neighborhoods that we've never delivered to. Now, the question that's still not clear is what's going to happen with Dine-In and will it come back strong? Will it come back stronger? Will it come back weaker? Will, Will people be so thirsty for going out that it might actually at some point impact delivery. When the uh, lockdown started in mid-March, Disney Pixar had a movie that was just released in theaters. So we were planning to go see it. Obviously, everything shut down. And a week later, we see the same movie released on streaming for $19, which is cheaper than going what, to a movie. What, yeah, well, for a family of four going to see a movie, which would be around double that. How, what kind of hybrid should your business be to still offer some dine-in experience, depending on how safe people feel? It's probably going to be some sort of a hybrid, an evolving hybrid over the next decade. You are heavily visible in shopping malls in Jordan, at least one of them. Can that be your virtual kitchen <laughs> if the mall decides not to collect the same kind of rent? <laughs> The interesting part about when you're selecting a virtual kitchen, the metrics of selecting that location are very different than selecting Mm. a a retail space. But in a hybrid model where... Yeah, we're actually testing a hybrid model now in a store that we have in Toronto Mm -hmm. because uh, interestingly, it fits both criteria. Yes. Um, It's on a high street and it actually has a back alley that you can deliver from. So it actually fits both criteria and it is centrally located for delivery. For pickup as well. Now, when you're selecting a location for a virtual kitchen, the questions that come into mind are ease of access for delivery drivers, geographically centered. Preferably, it's like right off the high street in an area that has big delivery reach. And actually, what you just ask are the pains and the issues that we're actually dealing with on a daily basis. How do we remodel our stores into becoming that hybrid? Some of our stores are perfect. They fit that criteria perfectly. And some stores are, like you said, in a mall on a third floor that will be difficult to fit that hybrid uh, model. Another very important word in delivery is convenience. Interestingly, I uh, had a very uh, skilled consultant and he was telling me uh, that he never expected the day to come when convenience trumps the food quality. And in delivery today, the first metric is convenience and speed yeah. of service, etc. And not having to worry about 100 people calling you just to make sure that you get that meal on time. That's what's been the struggle with grocery deliveries these days. I've tried it a few times. Literally one of the orders I got, I was on the phone five different occasions with the guy who's collecting the item. Because, yeah. uh, because their inventory also is mismatched. Uh, they have to replace items. They yeah. have to call you each time. Interestingly, what will happen in the coming uh, year, for sure, this year, uh, is what they're calling dark supermarkets. And these will focus on convenience and speed. So basically, they will be warehouses that are fully automated. They will not have a shop front. So that's the future of grocery delivery, I think. Because currently with grocery delivery, you have what they call the shopper or the picker. Yeah. The person that has to actually go through the store and figure out where things are. 
I heard that Tarabat is working on the dark grocery model. Wow. And probably the reason they're the reason they've onboarded so many grocery stores is to figure out the data and what's being ordered the most. Uh, it's the Amazon warehouse style yep. instead of a supermarket. Um, yeah, and I think that our kids one day will actually be surprised at the fact that we had to walk in to a grocery store with a cart and we had to and, actually and, collect yeah, things. And, and pull out your wallet. Yeah. Um, yeah, do you remember that viral video that Amazon released from uh, Whole Foods in Seattle where people walked in and walked out with their items and the, yes, like some kind of infrared would deduct the amount yep. from your account well, as you yep. walked out. So minimal contact. And I think contact, contactless payments now uh, will also be very big. Yeah. We're, we're actually studying the idea of you walk in, there's a QR code on the table, you scan it, you have a nice looking menu on your phone, you order through your phone, and then you actually pay through your phone. Yeah, absolutely. As long as there's unification of payment methods, like in the US, they've had Apple Pay for many years. But in Jordan, my bank, has their own barcode scanning units in a few outlets in Jordan. And I've used them because they've given incentives. But you can't have every single bank install their own hardware. Nobody yeah. will aggregate this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Endeavor. Endeavor is, uh, is an entrepreneur network that I was approached eight years ago to become part of. It's an interesting selection process where you have to pitch your business idea and the scalability of your business to a panel of experts. First panel is a local panel, and then the next panel is a global panel where people come in from all over the world and put holes into your business model and try to challenge you on whether your business is scalable, etc. That is the most unique part, I think, of the Endeavor experience is it actually allows you to take a step back from you know your day to day and look at your business from a bigger picture and figure out you know am I going in the right direction is it scalable and now once you get in Endeavor is an amazing network of entrepreneurs and mentors that support you through the journey in terms of advice in terms of connections this uh, time actually has really shown me as an entrepreneur and other entrepreneurs the power of Endeavor because we have had tremendous support from global network mentors just because of the uncertainty that this pandemic poses to companies uh, this uncertainty will actually either be a turning point for companies or it will be a, a point where companies will just disappear so i think endeavor has been a very interesting part of this journey continues to be especially in this case Entrepreneurs have the same struggles with the uncertainty that COVID-19 has impacted many businesses. Yeah, um, The impact will be so harsh that I can foresee that many restaurants, especially in the fine dining segment, will actually never be back. Yeah, the pandemic is going to be the kiss of death for many, many businesses. Yeah, and the delivery option for these restaurants, especially... Doesn't, the, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Suburban America, I visit the U.S. every year and I stay at, in a suburban area. Delivery is, is not a strong thing at all. Yeah. Just a few pizza places and a couple of places that deliver. The rest rely so heavily on dine-in or takeout on the way back from work. Yeah, it's a kiss of death, to be honest with you. It's unbelievable. I'm in the retail segment for accessories and apparel. And the government here in Jordan, they are struggling to figure out how will people buy their clothes. They announced last week delivery only. Imagine buying a, a $10 shirt and then it's the wrong size and then it has to be sent back and then back again. Where, so your delivery costs, it's a, the experience becomes a nightmare. So yeah. they, re, they re-evaluated and now you're allowed to go into the store. And they're also changing their minds on whether you can pay cash. And we're not all in the same boat. Some retailers don't have credit cards. They've never delivered in their life. A lot of neighbors that I have in the retail industry, they just started Facebook pages two days ago. Yeah. I mean, Jordan has Jordan is implementing one of the harshest, strongest lockdowns on the planet. Total control. And today is one of those days that you are not allowed to walk out of your house. You can't buy anything, medicine or anything casually. Do you think 
that Jordan is overusing the lockdown tool to contain the virus. It's obviously the only way to really contain the virus. Will it backfire? A lot of people in the U.S. are now shifting their opinion from pro-lockdown mm. to anti-lockdown because of the, uh, the magnitude of the problems that business drops have caused. Yeah, and today, uh, Dubai, يعني April 24th, They just announced that they will be opening up the economy in a phased approach. It's really the com- a polar opposite of what we're doing in Jordan. Actually, in Dubai, restaurants are open today. Mm-hmm. Even so, dine-in? Even dine-in. <laughs> And in Jordan, ac- uh, delivery is not uh, open yet. Yeah, you can't order a pizza in Jordan. Yeah, so... Um, 40 days now. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very interesting to see who's right. I think in Jordan, we've done an amazing job in controlling the, the spread of the virus. But I think what the challenges are yet to come on how the economy will stand up on its feet again. I think they've been a bit slow on the economic side. Mm-hmm. Just to give you an example, in restaurants, the Minister of Tourism came out in a press conference more than 13 days ago saying that restaurants will be allowed to open for delivery. However, not a single restaurant in Jordan is open today. So we're, we're talking about two weeks of red tape. Yeah. You know, our, the safety of our employees uh, is extremely important, the safety of our customers. And we have taken all these measures, yet we have not been able to deliver food yet. So um, I think it's a bit too slow. 14 days of applications and COVID tests is a bit uh, too much. Dubai and the UAE's decision is most related to real estate. I think that the real estate owners are they're devastated. And plus, malls are a part of culture there. I mean, there's, yeah. they don't have street, uh, street shops. Did you hear if they are shutting down AC units and making people eat uh, in the outdoor sections? Or they're just going back to business as usual? The funny thing is, it says that diners and staff must wear masks at all time in the restaurant. Yani, how do you eat if you're wearing a mask? It's going to so, be like the, like the niqab. You have to yeah. get in between. Yeah. And remove. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I think that's really unfair to restaurants because that means that landlords can claim rent. And in reality, who the hell is going to go to a restaurant wearing a mask? Landlords' rent collection really should be linked to footfall. There's a pizza by the slice shop that is a hole in the wall, literally. It's run by one guy. And there's no chairs. There's, no, there's nowhere to sit. The, 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 the shop is just a display and a, and, a, and a hot oven. There's nothing to do there. You can't get the virus from this guy because he literally uses the wooden spatula mm-hmm. and he brings you out the pizza and then he gives you a slice. That guy... <laughs> I mean, uh, all over the world, I'm sure that guy can, can get, do takeout and delivery. But in Jordan, yeah. it's so severe. We're proud. Every night, the government comes out and announces the number of new cases. Usually, it's, you can count them on one hand. It's a great thing to be proud of. But obviously, if you close down a highway and then you say, oh, guess what? We have zero uh, accidents. accidents. Of course, that's the easy part. Like you said, the hard part is the economics after easing up the lockdown. If you, if you actually watch what's happening in the U.S., you have a president talking about injecting people with disinfectants, and then you have people rioting uh, because they feel that this has been impacting their, uh, their rights. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough call because in reality, yes, it is not constitutional to make people stay indoors yeah. in the U.S. It's yeah. unconstitutional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so a lot of even sensible people are saying, if you're old, if you're sick, don't go out. It's your right. But don't make everybody else who wants to go out, go out. Yeah. But then obviously, then when people get yeah. sick, who's going to take care of you? And then the question is for the restaurant business. And will people be comfortable going to restaurants before the vaccine? It's so incremental. Ask yourself a question. Would you go right now? One of the malls nearby has a large supermarket that's open. Would you go into that supermarket today? Uh, if, it, I if, if it was right next door to you, if it was literally next door to you inside a shopping mall, everything was closed, but except for this giant supermarket, would you walk in? Uh, no, I wouldn't personally. Yeah. At this stage. Even with a mask and gloves? Maybe, maybe. See, that's, don't uh, people don't know. Uh, the groceries that you get from the supermarket 
have been mishandled. So yeah, but the groceries you disinfect. I mean, are you really disinfecting every can of hummus uh, that or tuna can that's in your closet? Yeah, I we. I Most people yeah. don't. Your guys yeah. have been doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, apparently, reports even from top uh, medics are saying you don't need to do that. Or as Trump uh, would suggest, spray it with disinfectant. <laughs> yeah. Spray it with chlorine <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. eat it. Yeah. <laughs> we both have kids struggling through homeschool. What do you think are the options this summer in terms of taking a break from reality? Today, I was thinking this morning, and we are opening restaurants in Aqaba and Isla. Okay. So today I was thinking that maybe we need to really like step on the gas on these restaurants to make yeah. sure they're ready for the summer. Yeah. Because uh, if Aqaba يعني, continues on this trend they're in with no tourists coming in, if they allow internal tourism, I think that's going to be the, really the only outlet. And I don't foresee people well, traveling. In two months when teaching is uh, done, people aren't going anywhere. And like you said, local tourism... It's going to be something very interesting to watch for. However, if you want to drive for four hours to the coastal town in Jordan, where would your tourists stay? Are hotels going to be functional? When is the hotel industry allowed to do local tourism bookings? Yeah. And the funny thing is, I was speaking to a hotel operator last week on my podcast, and he told me, can you imagine a hotel relying on local business only working for two days a week because that's local tourism. It's literally Definitely. 90% of the time, it's two days a week. Definitely. <laughs> Most hotels can't operate that. So what will people be more comfortable with? Staying in like furnished apartments that you clean yourself? <laughs> or will you be more comfortable staying in a hotel? The um, idea, yeah. I personally would be more comfortable staying in an apartment where I can control the environment. Well, the hotel, obviously, the, the idea that there has been hundreds of guests before you using the same stuff, can you really disinfect everything? Yeah, that's a daunting idea. So an apartment, there's probably only two families in a month that have stayed there, so it's not as risky. Yeah, It's, uh, it's a shit show, obviously, tour, tourism coming back. Uh, would you consider living in Aqaba for a few weeks? Yeah. Yeah, I'm considering summer, it as well. Yeah, Inter, you should, since yeah. you have that set up. People uh, who own businesses like you and I, our lifestyle is going to be extremely hectic in, in the next three months because of the operational nightmare of setting up the new rules of business. Yeah, yeah, honestly, we, we have plans in place ready for when and if one of our team members gets infected. Wow, yeah, you should. You have to. Yeah, big time. It's so sensitive. Uh, have you looked into the Swedish protocols of dining in where they've only reduced, I think, the density of dining in? Yeah, that's what Dubai is doing. 30% they reduced. Yeah, I'm sure they have uh, protocols for when one of their staff is sick and, and they've had tens of thousands infected. Do they have to announce that the waiter in this diner is sick? What have they been doing for the last six weeks? Uh, I haven't looked into that. <laughs> <laughs> And Dubai is going to be interesting. Are there rules about Definitely. infected waiters? Uh, this came out yesterday and I'm still reading through it. I, I don't think I will actually open our uh, yeah. dine-in. The overheads are just going to be... Not only the overheads. I mean, the risks when you have 500 cases a day. Oof. I guess they're really reading into the herd immunity philosophy, which actually now more people are believing in over the last week because of the Sweden model and even things like that cruise liner that has 3,700 people on it and only 12 deaths. But the data from that cruise ship are pretty encouraging. So there, yeah, there are interesting times coming up. Yeah. It's interesting to figure out our customers more worried about the driver or the people cooking their food there are so many moving parts at least your your cutlery and chopsticks and stuff like that were already sealed and sterile so you really have the driver to worry about and the kitchen the restaurant i think people are they they turn a blind eye to thinking about kitchens you know most people when they see how a hot dog is made they'll stop eating hot dogs but they don't want to look there. It's just like, the, it's better not to see it. Uh, for me, when I see the grocery checkout guy wearing gloves, I don't feel better because he's handled 20 people's money and credit cards and he hasn't changed those gloves. So to me, it's bullshit. No, what we're doing is uh, pre the lockdown, is we introduced something called the 20 minute hand wash commitment. And we have speakers in our kitchen that go off every 20 minutes with an alarm 
and employees need to wash their hands. That is amazing. Wow. Yeah, regardless if they're wearing gloves or not, yeah, regardless. they need to wash. Yeah. Man, that's amazing. That is yeah. amazing. You should market that. Yeah, we will be marketing it when we come back. It's called the 2020 rule. Wash for 20 seconds every 20 Oof. minutes. Amazing. Well, we should probably think about it for retail in general. We could actually maybe make a walk-in customers wash their hands as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Omar, thanks for joining us today. It's been uh, eye-opening. And Thank Ramadan you. Mubarak to you. Thank you for hosting me, and I hope it was insightful. Hey. 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 Hey.